montage, uh, and it's a device that also fabricates other devices, which I think is just a cool concept. And if you notice, right in the bottom right, uh, there's a little port. I don't know if anyone can recognize that. Anyone know what that is? And it enhanced like a TSI? Enhance a little more? Enhance one more time? It's an Arduino. So the MakerBot, the first or the second uh, MakerBot 3D printer ran off an Arduino Uno, which is 90% of you are using the same microcontroller to power your robots, your LED contraptions, or whatever you're doing, your robotic arms and all that. Uh, so the same technology that's going into your projects is going into what came to be this huge, like, big million dollar company that just recently got bought up. Uh, so the MakerBots, we've got two in the back, they don't quite work. Uh, so that's another anecdote about uh, taking engineering into the future. It doesn't always work out. But I mean, big, massive industry of 3D printers, they look awesome. And it all started from this Arduino and this laser cut like prototype from the garage. Designing for fabrication. How do we do that? Um, designing for fabrication takes form in a few simple tips. And I'm kind of copying this from uh, do any of you know who Charles Guan is? Charles Guan is former professor, former TA from MIT. Uh, he does a lot of robotics work. He participates in BattleBots, Combat Robotics a lot. And he wrote this guide called How to Build Your Everything Really, Really Fast, which is a guide to building everything really, really fast. Uh, and tips include no mostly tightened nuts. I think a few of you have these, they don't look like this, but they've got these uh, grippers that are powered by a servo for your robotic arms. They open and close, they hold things. And all of the shafts here, all the bolts that come through, have to be retained on the other side by something, by a nut or a shaft collar or a set screw or something like that. Uh, and often what you'll find is people who are new to mechanical engineering are just going to put a nut on the other side and be like, okay, I'm going to tighten this about you know, this much and it's going to hold on there uh, and it's going to keep everything secure. When in reality, you never want to rely on this, especially for something like a robot, which is doing a lot of motion. If you just tighten a nut to like a certain degree, that's not very precise engineering. Other tips. This is impossible to assemble. These two pieces are supposed to fit together. That's what those tabs and holes are for. But you can't do that because there's this strip of whatever material in the way. No impossible assemblies. Keep in mind when you're designing whatever you design, again, it doesn't matter how cool you make it if you can't actually build it. So keep in mind ease of assembly when you're building, when you're designing whatever you're designing. Uh, structural integrity. So I know very little about this because I've never done any finite element analysis, complex stuff or whatever. But just by eye, which one is stronger? The second one. The second one, the one on the right. Uh, be mindful of stress failure prone area, areas. Uh, for a few of you, this is especially important. For example, your robotic arms, if you've got a lot of stress on a certain joint, you want to make sure that that joint won't fail, won't fall over, won't collapse, you won't break the motor. Which is why, for example, in this case, we add a little flange on the side, which is preventing that kind of lateral stress from breaking this component. So let's talk about material science. Uh, this is my front front view of my t-shirt cannon, the 3D CAD drawing of it, and let's talk a little bit about what materials go into that. So some of the considerations you want to make when you're engineering are not just what do I do with my, with my materials, but also what materials do I use in the first place. And these are some of the many, many factors that you might want to consider when you use your materials. So we've got wood, and foam, and aluminum, um, plastics of all kinds, 3D printed materials, everything. How accessible is it? How easy is it to use? Uh, accessibility can refer to just do we have it on hand. The reason that my device is built mostly out of wood is because I had some wood lying around that I could laser cut. We've got a lot of wood, we've got a lot of foam, a lot of PVC pipe, a lot of uh, aluminum and stuff like that. So all those materials are accessible, but something like, you know, milling something out of like a solid block of platinum, that's not really accessible. Uh, how dense is the material, especially for things that move, the weight of a material per unit volume uh, is very, very important because if something is too heavy, it will not be able to move efficiently or won't be able to provide whatever functionality it needs. Right? If we make a robotic arm uh, out of like I don't know, a solid block of steel, it's going to be really, really heavy and it probably won't be able to move that well. So keep in mind the density of the material, even though the strength of steel is appealing, it probably isn't the best tool for the job. Ease of use, again this refers to uh, how easily can I fabricate something. How easy is it for me to drill a hole in something? Is it going to take me an hour? Am I going to dull the bit when I'm doing it? Or am I going to be able to just drill through it like I can uh, with wood or something like that? Uh, expense. Once again, how easily can I get this material? So the wood, all this stuff here, is, as far as you're concerned, at no cost to you. All this material is accessible. But if we have to buy a block of something for like $100, that suddenly adds up to a lot of expense. 
strength. Again, this is all coming together as uh, you know, how rigid is my material? The air, the wing of an airplane is built out of some very, very uh, well-tuned composites, and it's built in a very precise way so that you can get the maximum strength of the material for the least weight. So strength is a huge, huge concern, and it's the subject of a lot of money in the engineering industry. Wear resistance, uh, something like gears. If you're spinning something really, really quickly, like my wheels are spinning really quickly on there, you don't want those gears to suddenly shred and rip apart in the middle of that motion. If you're powering a jet engine, you don't want the turbines to suddenly uh, shear and cause the whole engine to explode. That would be a terrible failure mode. So keep in mind wear resistance, among all of the other things with your materials. Let's talk a little bit about types of motion. Um, a lot of you are using servos to rotate things. Uh, you're using, let's see, little DC motors. We've got a few brushless motors for the hovercraft people. I think we've got one or two steppers as well for products that I can't recall what they are. Um, there are many different ways of imparting motion. Here's a little linear actuator that I designed. It's performing motion in a line, hence linear. And linear motion can be useful for a few types of things. So Cali, for example, is building a robot in which the, the manipulator at the end of it, the robotic arm, presses keys on a keyboard. That pressing down motion is a linear motion. So linear motion can be useful for that. Uh, and also, I believe, no, oh, I didn't include it. Uh, a lot of 3D printers, most 3D printers for that matter, will have linear motion to position that extruder to move it very, very finely. Uh, so linear motion is a huge, huge uh, deal. It's a big way of moving things around. Uh, and it can be very precise or it can be very problematic depending on how you do it. Because if something's moving in a line, the friction along that line can be very, very significant. The counterpart to that is rotary motion. So this is the full CAD model of what hopefully that's going to become in the future. It's a full robot. Uh, and the whole shooter, that thing is articulating, rotating. Rotary motion is what most of us are dealing with. Servos, DC motors to spin wheels, servos to move a robotic arm. Uh, that's rotary motion. You can actually kind of see uniquely that linear motion, in this case, is causing rotary motion. They're intertwined. The movement of this linear actuator right here is pushing up the entire shooter along that line. Uh, good, I have this video. So any of you watch BattleBots? A few of you. Sweet, okay. Uh, last season I was watching this and I was looking at, this is Charles Bond's robot on the left. Uh, he has this robot called Overhaul and he's got this linear actuator, it's this block right here that's gripping on another robot. So let's see if I can find that moment. I also have no sound so this is a little bit less entertaining. Let's come right here. So right now these robots are kind of intertwined, they're kind of stuck together, and you can see Charles' robot, which is called Overhaul, is trying to grip onto the other one. And that gripper, you can see right there, holding 250 pounds of titanium, this robot weighs about 250 pounds, uh, just by that one contact point using a very powerful linear actuator. So linear motion can be very strong, uh, in combination with the rotary motion which he's performing there, uh, there's a lot that you can do. But you have to tune this very, very finely and deal with the friction, deal with tolerances, all these different concerns that you have whenever you're engineering anything, especially in this case battle rock. Uh, let's talk about motors. Okay, a lot of you are using different types of motors in your projects. So you have DC motors, uh, brush, brushless steppers, servos, I don't think I see any pneumatics around here. There's a few fluid projects, I don't really know how that's going to work out, we've got a few pumps in here. Um, on that device right there, I've got two types of motors, and only two. Up front, these are brushed DC motors. There's a little brush in there, um, copper strands all wound together that brushes against what's called a, uh, an axis of commutator. So those DC motors, they can range in size from the little 1.3 volt ones that you use in your RC tanks to those massive like 300 watt motors that are on there. Uh, and on the left, I have a servo. So I've actually got two types of servos on there. I have what's called a quarter scale servo, which is about twice as big uh, as a normal servo. And I've got just like a normal servo that you've been using uh, for robotic arms and grippers and all that kind of thing. So servos, DC motors, no matter what it is, it comes in many shapes, sizes, and forms depending on your application. Uh, but the use of them is very, very specific. Servos have a built-in potentiometer. Who knows what a potentiometer is? Uh, uh, it's uh, a built, it's a pretty much a, it takes current through it and you can control the amount of resistance through the wiper inside of it. Right, yeah, a variable resistor of sorts. So that built-in potentiometer inside the servo provides feedback. It tells the servo at all times where it is, what position it's at. This is useful for fine position control just like we have in robotic arms. When you want to move something, 
to a very precise location. Conversely, brushed DC motors generally don't have very good positional control. They're good for moving things fast and cheaply. So that DC motor, its only job is to spin in one direction really, really quickly, which is what brushed DC motors and brushless DC motors tend to be good at. Uh, which brings me to brushless DC motors, which only a few of you have. Uh, they're common on aircraft uh, like these drones. They will almost always, large drones are gonna use brushless DC motors. Um, they're light, they're fast, um, they're efficient, they move very smoothly. So brushless DC motors will often draw more current, you might find, uh, but they offer a few advantages and disadvantages between brushed and brushless. For example, since a brushless motor has no brush, as the name suggests, it can, it can last longer when it's moving really fast because there's no friction against this brush inside and it doesn't wear out. Stepper motors. Stepper motors are very fascinating. Uh, they allow for very, very precise positional control as we can see here with this robotic arm. So let's just give it a little bit. This is like a hobby size maybe robotic arm and it's moving incredibly smoothly, incredibly quickly. And this is both the symphony of uh, software and hardware. But stepper motors are making this smooth motion possible. So grabbing a uh, peg, moving it over to a precise position, drawing a shape, uh, moving it over to another position. All these kinematics are possible thanks to the precision and the uh, speed of stepper motors. Again, incredibly accurate. That's very true. And all of those industrial robotic arms that you see on like assembly lines or building, I don't know, like carving things out of solid blocks or whatever, uh, those generally have massive stepper motors inside to position them very finely. Motors, okay, that's a lot of motors. And I sold it straight from Adafruit. So most of you, let's see, we've got most of you are using these micro sized servos, a few of these normal servos. We've got some DC motors, gear motors look like this. Uh, big motors, a couple servos, and some brushless motors. So we kind of covered the whole spectrum here. You're never going to get everything you want well, in life, but also in a motor. Um, so you're going to have to probably pick at most between three of these variables. And there are many more to consider. Um, but position control, speed control, efficiency, and cost. So on motors, there's a few things that you might want to do. For a linear actuator, for example, you might want to move that linear actuator to a very precise point, which is what position control could be useful for. Or if you're like AJ and you're building a self-parking car, you want to move to a very specific point between two other cars so you don't crash into one of them. Position control is very, very useful, but it can be very, very complicated. Speed control. Um, if you're flying a drone and you want to like get a rotor to spin at a precise speed so you can go to a certain altitude, you want to control that speed very, very finely within a few RPMs. Uh, so speed control is also important. Efficiency. How much electricity am I wasting? How much am I dissipating as heat? when I use my motor. Steppers are notoriously bad at efficiency, and most they might have like 50% efficiency. Uh, so there's a lot of heat loss with steppers. That's why you might find when a 3D printer is running for like 13 hours on one of your massive prints, which is why we don't print boxes, uh, you might find it gets very, very hot. And cost, uh, some of these motors are more expensive than the others, so uh, always cost is a factor. Uh, DC motors, you might get uh, good speed control and good efficiency and good cost, but you might get terrible position control unless you add an encoder, but that takes away the cost. So now you have position and speed control, but not uh, and you have efficiency, but not cost. Uh, steppers, you might have good control but and good cost, but poor efficiency. Uh, and you're always gonna be toying around with the goods and the bads of everything. So it's up to you as engineers to select the optimal motor and the optimal material and all that uh, for your product. Yeah, so here's an RC tank that I robbed right off the Blue Stamp website that somebody made a few years ago. It's got an ultrasonic sensor on the front. So let's talk a little bit about sensors. Um, what does a sensor do? Send. It, uh, it, tell me it senses. Uh, it receives a signal and then it sends it back to your Arduino. And then that Arduino sends it back to your computer and then the, your code interacts with that to uh, do something. Yeah, basically. Uh, it's an input. Uh, whenever you're feeling something, smelling something, tasting, seeing, whatever, that's a sense. And your robot, by definition, has to sense something in order to respond to stimulus, to its environment. Uh, and we can kind of extrapolate from that example, just one ultrasonic sensor on the front that detects distance. Uh, Google self-driving cars. Big spinning LiDAR laser on the roof, uh, but it performs the same exact function. function. Range finding, finding the distance to an object, telling you how far it is, uh, and consequently you can determine whether you should avoid it or drive over it. Same principle. Uh, here's a robotic arm I made a few years ago because, not a few, a few months ago, because I thought it would illustrate uh, something that a few of you are actually doing as well pretty nicely, which is 
position control with DC motors and servos using sensors. So here's my big brother on the left. Uh, it's about two feet, two feet in length, robotic arm. Uh, and on the bottom right, it's kind of hard to see. There's a little puppeteer robotic arm. It's got a bunch of potentiometers on it. Those potentiometers are providing feedback to the motors, telling it where to move based on the small arm. So if I move the small arm to one position, the big arm is going to move to the same position. And it's going to be kind of an intuitive way of controlling things just by moving around this model of the arm. This is also a good reminder to do documentation, um, because I didn't write anything about this, which is poor documentation, but I did take pictures. So do remember to write up things, uh, get media for your, for your projects, because it will be useful in the future, as we can see right now. Uh, wireless communication. I got a few specific requests for this, and I confess to not knowing very much about it. But there's a few um, common types of wireless communication, wireless communication standards that you might run into, especially here at BlueStamp when you're working with your projects. Bluetooth is one of them. I think about a quarter of my sections are running with some kind of Bluetooth wireless communication for talking to their phone or for communicating with an RC vehicle or whatever purpose it is. Bluetooth is useful. Uh, some of the challenges of Bluetooth, because everything has a give and take. You'll see the range here is at most 100 meters and about 10 meters uh, at worst. So most of the cheap, affordable Bluetooth models that you can, that you can actually get uh, for Arduino compatibility will not give you a great range. Uh, frequency is going to stay the same. Power, Bluetooth is pretty good at power. You, you might have heard about Bluetooth Low Energy, BLE. Uh, that's also a good way to conserve power while doing wireless communication. Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is power expensive. That's why when you turn on Wi-Fi on your phone, it tends to run out of battery faster. Um, conversely, because Wi-Fi is kind of common in urban areas, at least pretty much everywhere, uh, that's why it says it depends on router everywhere, uh, it can be good for long distance communication at the cost of physical like money cost, as well as energy. XB, XB so far have been a little bit challenging, I think. Uh, Mohit, we recently kind of resolved some of those issues, but XBs are especially for Arduino, is useful as a long distance radio. 300 feet is kind of the range for these things. Uh, they're small, they're decently inexpensive, I guess. Uh, they have to be configured, they have to be programmed, but once you do get that running, it should be fairly easy to use. And some of them have external antennas, so just keep that in mind for your future projects. If you ever need longer distance, you might be able to just get a longer antenna. Uh, okay, I forget why I put this in here. Oh, feedback, okay. So when you're driving behind the wheel of a car, and you're on the highway or something, and you're driving at like 65 miles an hour, and you like see in the, in the back, you see like a police car, you're gonna slow it down. You don't wanna break the speed limit if you're going like 90 down the freeway. So, that's a feedback mechanism. As a human driver, you don't wanna go too fast, and you don't wanna go too slow based on your surroundings. Same applies to robots. Uh, there's two types of feedback, two types of control. First one is closed loop control, so I just reused my GIF. Uh, I've got over there, small rotary encoder. It's like a potentiometer, but it can do more than one turn. Um, that encoder is providing me with the exact, well, roughly, uh, plus or minus a few degrees position of this piston thing at any given point in time. So this is closed loop control. I can tell the motor to move faster or slower depending on what position I want at what point in time. So I'm allowed to perform uh, fast motions without colliding into either side of the actuator, which I don't want, naturally because I have that sensor. Conversely, open loop control is what I'm using on those wheels right there. I don't really care how precisely I can move them. I'm not moving them to a certain point. I just want them to spin as fast as possible. So open loop control is cheap, uh, and it's good if you just want to spin something really, really fast, or if you don't need precise feedback. OK, that's all I have to announce. So I did promise that I was going to actually turn this thing on. Uh, last night, what happened was I had a speed controller right here that was supposed to take 40 amps. But it only takes 40 amps in the right direction. And I plugged in the voltage in the wrong direction. So I got a lot of sparks and a lot of smoke, which makes me nervous to turn it on. But I'm still going to try because it isn't failing, it's trying something new. Let's put that in. Let's get that to get over there. Go back.
That's all I got for you today. You don't get to keep that, sorry.